I'm Jennifer Tigane, and today is April 3rd, 2023. I'm here with Veronica conducting an interview as part of the Chicago Youth Movement's Oral History Project. Hi, Veronica. Thank you for joining me here today. Do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. Awesome. So if we could just start with you telling me a bit about your childhood, neighborhood, and family. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've been born and raised in Chicago all my life. Um, I this is kind of our family home too. Like this is the house where my family first migrated to in Chicago. Um, so this household has just a lot of like history and like a uh, family lineage and like history like that. Um, and I also coincide in the neighborhood um, named Marshall Square, which is near North Lawndale, Pilsen and Little Village. So kind of just somewhere in the middle. Um, and I would say that I'm very grateful for like where I live and just the fact that I've been able to learn so much about my family history um, and also see it. Um, yeah. Could you tell me, I guess, about like what that history looked like? Where did your family migrate from? And then anything you can remember from those early years of, of childhood? Yeah, um, my, my dad is from Jalisco, Mexico. Um, well, my mom is from Guerrero, Mexico. Um, so a lot of my cultural roots come from those two different areas. Mm. Um, and I would say that, oh, my, I don't know why this conversation feels like really difficult. Um, my, the relationship that I have like with my dad, like all, all, all of his family is here in Chicago. Mm. Um, except maybe like my aunt who lives in California um, and some cousins that I have in Arizona and of course like family that I have in Mexico mm -hmm. but all my life I've been very lucky to be connected to like all my aunts and uncles because they all migrated here from Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my mom's side of the family I really only got to meet my grandpa once when I was a baby mm -hmm. um, but he migrated back to Mexico went back home um, and I only have my grandma and my uncle here. So I don't really have that understanding or like that connection mm -hmm. to my mom's side of the family. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of like my customs and like my understanding of Mexico really does come from um, mm -hmm. conversations that I've had with like my aunts and my uncles on my dad's side, as well as like my dad and my grandma. Mm. Awesome. So what was it like kind of going to elementary school and early years growing up in Marshall? square yeah um i attended hammond elementary um which is on california california yeah um i went there until fourth grade and then i transitioned or transferred into salcedo scholastic academy okay. um so these two schools are literally right next to each other mm -hmm. um the only reason why i convinced my parents to transfer me is because salcedo is like this beautiful like huge school with a lot more resources than Hammond did mm. um, and by that um, the first thing that I can think of and like what really excited me about transferring to Salcedo was the fact that they had a pool mm. so I would have swimming classes in middle school I still don't know how to swim though <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was really exciting to me and something that like um, really like uh, challenged me I guess at a young age to think about like what that school was able to provide for me in terms of like just like my education mm. so what were the school communities look like what did the school communities look like between the two different schools mm. I would say that with Salcedo I mean I don't know because I I would say that with Hammond and Salcedo like from what I remember like there was just a lot of school spirit, like a lot of, like you would always see parents, um, teachers would always be involved um, in like our, our student lives and things like that. Mm. Um, so there was always that like richness and like that connection in terms of school community. I would say that really the only difference is just like the space. Um, because again, like Salcedo was this, it used to be a high school or a college, I believe. So there was just so much more space and so many more programs and like classrooms. So it was just a very like, you would just see more people than you would at Hammond. Okay. And they're yeah. both traditional public high schools or? Yes, both okay. public high schools. Okay. 
Well, not middle high school. Middle school. Yeah. yeah, middle school. Okay. So. That sounds good. Um, so I guess like having had that experience in middle school and elementary school, what did your transition journey into high school look like? And feel free to also explain it as to where organizing kind of came in for you. Yeah, um, I remember I actually had a really hard time um, thinking about high school and even like choosing what high school to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, I know when I transferred to Salcedo, like obviously as a young kid, as a a young student, like you're very like, um, at least for me, um, speaking from my personal experience, also being the oldest of five siblings, Mm -hmm. um, daughter of immigrant parents, right? There's that like pressure, um, and kind of those expectations to just be like an outstanding like example mm-hmm. to your siblings as well as like just a great student because um, I remember um, when I was being taught how to speak English it was like by my uncle um, mm-hmm. who would who would like give me little mini quizzes who would encourage me to watch like Dora the Explorer and like a bunch of like um, Spanish speaking but like English teaching shows mm-hmm. um, And so that's how I learned English. And he would like always like do like little quizzes for me and like just really challenge me and encourage me to really apply myself in my studies as well as like, just like, um, like opening up my skills, I guess, or yeah, Mm -hmm. just to get different skills. Um, So I bring that up because I know when I transferred to middle school, I had a really, I was a, I was a really good student. I was always with my A's, like never, never B's or C's. Like I was just always very academically like, um, good, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I transferred to middle school, I just had like a very, uh, when I transferred to South State, I had a very like a different, like a, like adjustment. Um, Mm -hmm. the, I, I didn't have a great relationship with my teacher either at the time when I was in fifth grade, like my relationship with her was really like hurtful I would say Mm. um so that like really like plummeted my I would say like my confidence and like comfort in applying myself in school Mm. um suddenly I started seeing like f's and like c's in my grades Mm. Um, I remember having to like ask my teacher like is there anything I can do to like like put my grades up and I would stay after school and like always like clean up the chalkboard so I could just get Mm -hmm. some extra credit um so I remember like that also like caused a lot of issues at home because I don't know I think I was a pretty angry like child you know Mm -hmm. um so that would bring up some issues at home um regarding like my personal relationship with my parents Mm -hmm. um so I mentioned that because obviously like as I as I was like very like into like I really loved learning I loved being in school like I would find myself applying myself into after school programs in middle Mm -hmm. school um just because I loved being at school I loved having my friends there and like my relationship with my teachers um and I bring that up because when my grades started to decline and kind of like that discomfort and like that lack of confidence in applying Mm -hmm. myself again academically it made it really hard to like focus on getting test scores because that's all that it was it was just Mm -hmm. test scores and test scores like you have to have good test scores that you are eligible to go to good high schools and even that conversation of like what is a good high school um and you would you would look at like ib schools or Mm -hmm. private high schools um i forgot what other high schools there are like the names of um Mm -hmm. the selective enrollment selective enrollment there you go thank you um and so eventually, like, because even even though you get like your SAT scores, your ACT scores, in order to even like be eligible for selective enrollment, like you still have to go and take another test. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I remember I wasn't eligible for selective enrollment. I remember how stressful that was and and how like I was very like, oh my God, like I'm not good enough. Like, mm. you know, I've been I've been feeling so pressured, like I'm just not a good student. Um, and I ended up, even though I wasn't eligible for selective enrollment, I was eligible for IB school, which is like international baccalaureate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would, I would like go to shadow days. Um, I would do my research because I really did care about school and I, and I cared mm-hmm. about that and going somewhere that I really enjoyed. Um, so I remember that there was like, a like an open house or like, um, 
what is it that where all these high schools like did like presentations mm. to show people what their high school was like mm. I remember um I attended it and I had seen this school named Back of the Yards High School and it was like a brand new school. It was located on 47th and Western. Um, I looked up like how far it was. It didn't look far to me and I and I liked the idea of taking a bus to high school. Um, and also the fact that it was just a really like small high school. It felt like I would feel comfortable in that space because um, I care about like building community, knowing who I'm around um, and things like that and just like it just felt like more comfortable for me. Mm. Um, so that's where I ended up going. I ended up applying to Back with the Arts High School. I got accepted and I was the second graduating class from there. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm sorry, I, I know you asked something else along with that. Yeah. No, I was just curious about the transition to high school. And then I asked if organizing came in for you early mm. in high school, if it came in later on. Yeah. Um, for me, my first introduction to organizing, I guess, I guess I actually didn't get introduced to organizing until my senior year of high school. Okay. Um, I would say that what I first got introduced to is like activism. Okay. Um, and, I, and I think the distinction is important just because organizing um, is something that I, I did, like I was employed to do for, for three mm-hmm. years. Um, and I like, can tell like the difference in schools and just like mm-hmm. the requirement of like work that needs to be put. Um, mm-hmm. Not to say that the differences are bad, it's just like, um, I just think that it's important to distinct that. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first introduction came to um, activism when I, I just found myself like really um, in love with my chemistry was it chemistry? Yeah, it was my chemistry class, um, mm-hmm. particularly because my teacher, my chemistry teacher was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I was also very like involved in after school programs. So I was just always like on the move, always like just mm-hmm. always after school. I was just, I wouldn't come home until like 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. most days. Okay. Um, what, what kinds of programs? Um, I was involved in a lot of after school matters as well as sports. Mm-hmm. Um, after I, I really loved all the programs that After School Matters provided just because there was such a wide range of like different things that you could get yourself involved and you don't have to like like you just had to be curious about it you know mm-hmm. um, I really love that I love being curious and just exploring things because I, I'm a very undecisive person mm-hmm. so just like having those options felt very like um, exciting and like uh, very thankful to have that you know Mm. um so I remember I remember my first after school matters program was uh um like how to document like documentation I remember um I was actually challenged to go to downtown Mm. um, and just interview people and I don't actually remember what the interview questions were but I just remember being so excited to just like connect with people and ask them questions and just like have an understanding of just who is in Chicago, um, Mm -hmm. as well as like documenting those stories and just the importance Mm -hmm. of that. Um, I was also involved in in softball and tennis in school um, and a little little tiny bit of volleyball. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, and then there was a point in my third year of high school where I would just say after school with my science teacher, her name was Miss Singh. I remember I would just stay after school. We would just talk. Like we would just talk. There was always myself and a group of students. And a lot of these conversations would be just like about personal things, but also like just things that we're noticing about the school. You know, mm-hmm. by this point, it's my third year. So now we have like a, a completely like a, a, a full school, right? Because mm-hmm. when I first entered, it was just myself, freshmen and sophomores. But now we had like freshmen, sophomores, juniors and seniors. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just started talking about things that we noticed, um, things that we would hear from teachers, um, Mm -hmm. and just like to hear about the history or I guess not even history, but just like how this school came to be. Cause like how I mentioned, it was a brand new school. Um, and it was just really fascinating to like connect with students that way as well, because like I mentioned, I, I am from Marshall Square and I would have to travel all the way to back of the yards. And I remember when I, when my cousins would ask me, they would be like, what high school are you going to? And I'd be like, oh, I'm going to back of the yards. And they'd be like, back of the yards, like, 
there's a lot of violence over there like why are you going over there and I at the time like my understanding of violence wasn't very like like I I would know of things but I didn't know how to like talk about them or Mm -hmm. how to like explore that topic Mm -hmm. Um, so I remember just being very like what do they mean by that like just like am I making a bad decision by going over there like do I avoid that area at all Mm -hmm. um and so we would just have conversations like that like we would hear about like the shootings that would happen in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. um how certain students from our school were getting like picked on by security guards or the police officers because our school actually has like a specific little office for cameras and like we would have two two policemen um in our school alongside like three or four security guards Mm -hmm. Um, so just like very like our interaction with policing like not only like inside the school but also like outside and just like Mm -hmm. we didn't at the time we didn't have that understanding of like the school to prison pipeline or like mm-hmm. the understanding of policing it was just more like we are talking about these patterns like these things that we're seeing as well as like our personal experiences mm-hmm. um and then we found ourselves like thinking like well what can we do like we see these issues like and we're calling them issues so what can we do about them mm-hmm. um and at the same time as these conversations were happening like amongst us and in, in this chemistry class with my teacher mm-hmm. um this was also around the time where trump was getting elected or trump was announcing his presidency whatever mm-hmm. um so there was a lot of just like I don't like tension and like Mm -hmm. and like mm, just like worry you know like what's going on like and like students just wanted to talk about that students really wanted to talk about it and do something about it so at the same time as like we're having these conversations um another club is getting uh introduced and kind of started or had been started and it was the Dream Pursuers, which is a, a club that's specifically for undocumented students um, who kind of need that space to talk, but also like for support and resources as they're like experiencing high school and like this, mm. these things that are happening outside of school. Um, mm. And also like uh, to help us out or to help undocumented students as they're applying for college and things like that. Mm. Um, and they were in this club was getting help Um, through a community organization called Brighton Park Neighborhood Council. Mm -hmm. And I think that eventually, because we started talking about this, we were just in in our student group, we were just like, you know what, like, how would we feel if we were to start a club too, Mm -hmm. a club where we get students to come over here and talk about issues and maybe we do something about it. Mm -hmm. Quickly, that became the Student Voice Committee um and we were able to kind of develop these ideas and these thoughts into like action and kind of like more um clearer topics like Mm -hmm. being able to name it as like right now what we're seeing and experiencing is the school to prison pipeline Mm -hmm. right now what we're seeing and like hearing is like microaggressions from our teachers um Mm -hmm. what you're experiencing is racism right like all these isms that we started learning and like developing Mm -hmm. our um ideas and experiences on yeah and that was all because we would be attending workshops and having conversations with organizers from brighton park neighborhood council Um, and because we developed just such strong relationships with the organizers from bpnc um we would start learning about how the things that we're experiencing within our school are also like directly connected to the community and like what's Mm -hmm. happening in Chicago Mm -hmm. um so I remember like I would I would uh always hang out with this organizer from BPNC her name is Olivia Mm -hmm. um and like I mentioned like I would always say after school anyways and sometimes there would be like events around campaigns and things that like I was curious about or like we were learning about Mm -hmm. and like myself and like other couple of students sometimes would get invited to these programs or these events Olivia would just be like there's actually a uh, an event happening right now um, at 6 p.m. Like, do y'all want to like join us? And I would just call my dad and be like, hey, dad, like, I'm not going to be home until like eight or nine. You know, I'm going to go hang out with Olivia. We're going to go to this event. And my dad would just be like, okay, <laughs> have fun, be safe. Um, so I would just spend like 
my entirety of like my junior and like senior year just attending these programs um, and just like developing my understanding of what's going on, you know? Um, so I would say like that's connected to activism because we were just like naming these issues and we're like, we have to do something about it. So we would set up meetings with the principal, set up meetings with teachers. Um, I would say like one of the most exciting things that we did as student voice committee um, was like have those meetings with our principal, but mm -hmm. there was also a time where um, because of these conversations and these and this planning that we had, um, students actually were able to lead a full teacher PD day mm -hmm. um, where we talked about adultism. Cause that was something that we felt like was scratching the surface to be able to talk about all these other issues and like things that we are noticing um, in our school community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just honestly, like my entire like high school experience, like thinking about this, like, I could talk about it forever because mm -hmm. um, it was just like such a, a very like clear introduction to like what we were experiencing in our community, like outside of the school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, back of the yards is is a beautiful community, and like the way that it's portrayed, like through the media, is like gang violence and like. There's so many like ga like gangs in this neighborhood. Uh, people are dying, which is like mm -hmm. so true. It is so real. Um, but there's also work that is being done, and there's also like the community is like ready and like actively like trying to heal from this um, mm -hmm. and trying to like resolve conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and it just became really hurtful when we started to understand that our school community was replicating and kind of perpetrating these same like cycles of violence and harm with students. Um, it was an IB, it was an IB school, but it was originally like the way that organizers from the community and, and community members wanted to bring the school is that they wanted it to be a community high school because students were being forced to cross gang lines. Mm -hmm. um, because they had no other options but to go to like Kelly or um, Kiri or other other schools in the community mm -hmm. that just weren't actually in the community like they always had to like leave yeah. um, so back of the yards the like, intention was to be a community high school but it got transitioned into an IB high school which is like not a bad thing you know like but because the eligibility for IB schools is like you have to be academically like inclined, like mm -hmm. very good at testing, very good at this. Um, it made it really difficult for students to, from the community to like enter the high school or they were getting kicked out from the high school um, mm -hmm. because there were just so many issues that were connected to the community and like the school um, mm -hmm. community that like the only response that our, our school had for students who needed like extra support and extra mm -hmm. guidance and like resources was to like take them to the police office or like the security mm -hmm. office um was to take them to counseling um which you know in sounds like a good idea but it's not when the teachers and, like the staff don't have an understanding of the community and like the person that they're talking to as well as like compassion and empathy and that was something that was really lacking mm -hmm. um and it's just like directly connected to the school to prison pipeline right because right. our students you know they need support and they need like guidance and resources but they're not being given that because they're just being automatically like pushed outside of the school and yeah. back into where they're getting harmed yeah um, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm yeah. curious if you, looking back at your high school years and back of the yards, if there's a specific situation or a campaign, I guess, that SVC did that stands out to you, that kind of drove home that point for you. Mm. Yeah. I would say that there's yeah, I would say that one that really comes to mind is um, it was this food policy that we were trying to fight. Um, a lot of us didn't like really like the school lunch at school. And I, and I feel like that's still relevant to this day. Like CPS mm. does not have the best lunch for mm. students, especially like for those who rely on school lunch um, or stay after school and like need more food to like keep their day going. 
um and students would always bring like their own food like I would always bring my ramen cups I would always be making my own little ramen at school Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden like it was like it was like the middle of the year and all of a sudden there's like this announcement saying food is no longer allowed like this was part of the policy forever ago like why why are students bringing food um and students were really upset about this because why is there that like that's what we called it we called it a food ban Mm -hmm. and what made it so like visible for us is that the next day after this announcement was made all of a sudden security guards whenever you would walk in they had this huge like and I'm talking like huge like this just humongous garbage bag Mm -hmm. and it was just filled with all the food and snacks that students were bringing just like it felt like it was like a like if you ever if you've ever been to like those gift exchange Mm. um, for children it just felt like that like it was just like this bag full of like apples and like like cheetos and just like my ramen was being like taken away from me um as well as just like actual dishes that were like created by students to bring to school Mm. for them to eat during lunch and students were just so upset. Like we, as SVC, we had some hard like difficulties like getting students to be involved just because they would be involved in other clubs or j- they just like didn't have that understanding or those same experiences or feelings towards the experiences that we were seeing. Mm. We had some like difficulty like getting students to participate as well as like try to learn about what we're trying to get at. Mm. Um, But this was something that like students were really like passionate about and started Mm -hmm. to like understand like student policies because every year we're we're given the CPS handbook with like all these policies and we don't really look through them at all but you're you're forced to like bring it back signed and most people just sign it and just turn it back into the school but nobody actually ever like looks into it and like studies it and like sees like what rights we have or don't have as students inside a public school um so this was kind of like a a really good opportunity for us as SVC to like get students engaged but also remind them that spaces like ours exist where Mm -hmm. we're able to talk about these issues and things that frustrate us and try to because at the end of the day we are trying to collaborate with our school staff like we are Mm -hmm. trying to invest in a healthy relationship with the adults in the building because we want to be listened to. We want to come to an understanding um, and like make decisions together. Um, Because at the end of the day, like these decisions should be centering students because it is who it affects the most. Um, And so all of a sudden, (laughs) the the name of the campaign was like, we are hangry, which is like hungry and angry. Uh, And it all started with like, us creating like this Facebook group together and we just invited all the students that we like trusted Mm -hmm. um, to come up with ideas of what we should do and like to combat this like what are we gonna um, um, protest basically Mm -hmm. like have our understanding of this and then we started writing petitions on just like this is why we need to be able to have food and if the issue as to like why we're not allowed to bring food is because of rodents or like people bringing in like possible like marijuana or like Mm -hmm. alcohol like we can work together to figure out a way to prevent this you know like you can't just ban food because someone Mm -hmm. brought an edible Mm -hmm. you know like that's a real conversation that like has to happen and like we can all understand like why that isn't ideal to bring to school but it's also like why would a student bring that in the first place Mm -hmm. you know what kind of conversation is happening there where a student at like the age of 15 is is having um access to drugs like that you know mm-hmm. um so we were we were just very open to having those conversations and like talking about that yeah but our school wasn't because their immediate response to that was let's just ban food mm-hmm. uh, so once we had that petition we all just like decided the next day because once again the school would just like have their trash bag ready at the beginning of the school day so that they could just take our food Mm. um as and then part of what the principal and like the 
sorry, the main office decided to do is that during lunchtime, students can go into the office and get their food. But that was just like super disorganized because then students like the line would just be humongous. And then by the time that students got their food, like our lunch period was over. So it just didn't make sense. Um, so knowing how the, the school was responding to like the, the food that was being brought in, we all thought, why don't we all just bring like an apple? <laughs> Let's just all bring an apple or two or how many you want to bring. And we know that the school is going to collect them at the day. So let's just fill up their trash bag with just like apples. Mm. Let's just bring so many apples that they just get sick of it. But also like the optics of it, right? Like our school is really snatching these apples because mm-hmm. someone brought an edible, you know, or this is someone maybe just brought an apple because it's the snack that they need, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so once the optics were were there, we took pictures, we took it to Twitter. We were just like, adding back of the yards um as well as just like documenting it Mm. um and part of that action as well was like we were just opposing on eating the school lunch so nobody went to eat the school lunch for like the first 15 20 minutes of our school our lunch Mm. period Mm. um and I still remember this to this day but when we all decided to do that I, I think someone ended up sharing some of that info to the the main office people to like the adults um which was fine because at the end of the day like we all still who those who were committed and like trying to take action like we all still did it mm. um and my I remember my two teachers it was Mr. Diagostino and Mr. Rotman both like social studies no Mr. Rotman was like social studies and like that type of subject mm-hmm. area and then Diagostino was for English and reading and these two white male teachers, when they saw that we were opposing this and they saw the petition, they saw that we were taking action against this food ban that was happening and decided not to eat the school lunch. While we were all just sitting at the the lunch tables without food, they decided to walk into the school lunch line, get food and just eat in front of us. And I remember they were like eating the food like so dramatically. They were like, oh, this is so good. Like just rubbing it in our faces you know and it just felt like a very like like a huge like just huge disrespect you know like wow this is where you stand when it comes to students like maybe maybe you don't agree with the way that we are choosing to take action on this Mm -hmm. but the fact that you like decided to respond to it that way in a way it's just really disrespectful and hurtful because I actually like really enjoyed my English class with Mr. Diagostino. Like I really enjoy that class. Um, and I and I always thought he was a great teacher. Like I always learned so much from him, but to see this side of him, to see this response and, and where his values are in terms of like how he feels about students and how we felt about an issue, it just felt really hurtful and harmful mm-hmm. because that greatly affected my relationship with him because it made me feel like he was someone that I could no longer approach no longer felt comfortable that I would be listened to or Mm. cared for even and it just felt very like just aggressive you know and a very aggressive take on his behalf and Mr. Rothman's behalf and And once students saw that, and this is also the part that was hurtful too, is because once students saw them, the students who were like committed, like suddenly felt very like, oh, like they feel bad. Like they feel guilty Um, because once again, this is an adult. This is someone that you look up to. This is someone who you spend your entire like school year with, you know, like we spend four years with these people. Mm. And just to have that like mistrust and kind of like that hurt, it like discouraged a lot of our students who were there. Mm -hmm. It made us just feel like, oh my God, like, oh, like maybe we shouldn't have done that. Um, And it was just like a very like setback, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But that was kind of the start of a pattern that the teachers started to like, kind of show their true, like, I don't want to say colors, but like they just started to show how they felt Mm -hmm. about, clubs like student voice committee or students who were outspoken like student voice committee Mm. um and I and I just directly relate that to like 
just that like school community aspect of it right yeah. because once again these were white male teachers who had no connection to the community whatsoever mm-hmm. you know if they saw a student who was like having a hard time outside of the school maybe was involved in a gang maybe was involved in drug like uh, taking drugs or something like that like they had no understanding of why a student might do that or not even understanding but even to try to have an understanding of that you know mm-hmm. um and like to not build a relationship with that student to immediately think of them as like lesser um it was just really hurtful and very like racist also mm-hmm. um, and microaggressive um but yeah yeah, that's very interesting. I'm curious if you feel like that is reflective of other relationships with teachers and school administrators in this in the school building. If that kind of seemed like it was a bit of a culture, or those were the exceptions. Yeah, um, like directly talking about back of the yard, like my yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I would say yeah, because. We could like we quickly started seeing and like naming it because once we noticed it from these two teachers who once again like everyone really like everyone in the school had decent and good relationships with these teachers mm-hmm. and like just to switch up um mm-hmm. we had a lot of white teachers in that school a lot of them mm-hmm. and most of them weren't from anywhere near the community like neither back of the yards or any of the residing neighborhoods um most of them would be in pretty like predominantly like gentrified neighborhoods or just really far north side Mm -hmm. um I'm trying to remember like any other I mean mm, kind of like once again like more of a personal experience and again this is all during the Trump era too so it just felt like Mm -hmm. a lot more heavier and like Mm -hmm. just more like just a lot of hurt, yeah. <laughs> a lot of hurt because even when Trump was elected, mm-hmm. like that day, like we were at school the day that he was elected and all the teachers, like I remember I was in my math class and people were just like not having a day. Like mm-hmm. we were just not feeling okay at all. And so many of our teachers just didn't want to talk about it at all. They didn't want to make any space at all to like talk mm-hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. um and it just felt really hurtful because again like as a school community like the way that I think is if someone is hurt if it's multiple multiple people that are hurt or obviously going through something or obviously affected by something like Mm -hmm. we as a community need to be there for each other and in whatever way that may look like Mm -hmm. Um, and again this is a small school and like it just felt very like nothing was said even through the principals or like the main office um counselors were available but you know it's a small school how many counts i think we only had like three counselors Mm. um which is probably more than other schools but it's still not like i don't know it's also like you have to trust a lot in a counselor to be able to understand what you're going Mm. through or what you're feeling and if you don't get that notion from the entire school community, like how can you expect that? How can you expect to receive that from like Mm. one person, you know? Yeah. Um, And then for me personally, I know that my senior year, I had really bad, like I had a really bad interaction with my art teacher to the point where we actually had to try to set up um, like a restorative, conversation amongst us Mm -hmm. um and at the time the teacher who was like strongly supporting me at and through this process was my my English teacher um and she was Asian so the reason why we she wanted to really support me through this is because she actually had a similar Mm -hmm. um, interaction like this when she was in high school Mm -hmm. and the interaction was that at the time I was really involved in Pilsen Alliance Mm -hmm. Um, because I started to want to learn about gentrification. I started to see it in my neighborhood and I knew that Pilsen um, was going through something, uh, was greatly going through gentrification Mm -hmm. um, because of the the rise of housing costs as well as just the rise of businesses that were locally owned by Mm -hmm. community members being shut down. And all of a sudden it's like Talia Hall 
is making thousands of dollars, um, but also like has a really racist staff. Mm. So it was just like those conversations that were happening for me um, as I started noticing like local businesses in my community like slowly disappear. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I became involved with them, I further like, that's when I learned about gentrification. Mm-hmm. That's when I was able to name it as like, oh, that's what's happening. It's gentrification. Right. Um, so I remember like I was like learning through this and I was also just a really angry person at the time. I was just mm-hmm. very like angry because I'm like, why is this happening? Like, how is it that we can't really do much about it besides like yell at people or like show up mm-hmm. to their meetings where we're not even listened to, you know, where we're kicked out because of what we believe in or what we're experiencing Mm -hmm. as well as just like dealing with politicians you know so I was just really angry and I and I just like found myself expressing that a lot Mm -hmm. um and I loved my art class I was uh so I mentioned I was an IB and Mm -hmm. part of the program that I was in was CP so a lot of my time was spent in art classes and art stuff so Mm -hmm. I would spend my lunch period I would spend three hours a day in my art class um and I really trusted my art teacher I had a really strong relationship with him until one day um I posted something on Instagram I posted something on Instagram along the words it was like a it was like a sticker it was a picture of a sticker that said like stop gentrifying Pilsen or something along the lines of like fuck gentrification something like that Mm -hmm. and I posted that on my Instagram page and my art teachers followed me on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the caption that I put was, if I see another white person walking down 18th street, I'm going to tell my dog to bite you. Mm-hmm. And at the time, like, I, I strongly remember, like, I was just angry and I was just like, oh, like, I'm going to tell my dog to bite you. But I also meant it in like a, like a, a funny, like, because mm-hmm. I, you hear my dog she's like a little chihuahua like that's who I'm thinking I'm thinking about my little chihuahua dog just like barking at you and like you know but it was like funny to me but also I was just like really pissed off Mm. because at the time a project that I was working on with Pilsen Alliance was to oh my god I forgot the the name of it but it was basically to stop this coalition that was in Pilsen Mm. um, allowing a corporation to buy an acre of land Okay. because they wanted to develop it um so it was to stop develop like rich developers from buying this land and I remember it like failed or we just something something I had just learned about something that just really pissed me off and that's mm-hmm. the only way that I could have that I could think of and had access to expressing my anger was just like posting that picture and like writing that caption mm-hmm. the next day my art teacher I, I remember this like vividly because I remember it was a really like shocking moment for me, but also I was really like emotional. Mm-hmm. Again, I was angry. It was the next day I'm at school. And I remember my teacher, we have like these rolling chairs. My teacher like just rolls up to me in, my, in his rolling chair. And then he just like tosses this paper onto my desk, like literally just like tosses it. And I'm like doing something. So I look at it and then he's like, he stops and he's like, explain this to me. And it's a screenshot of my Instagram post. Mm. And I was like, yeah, like, and I explained to him the project that I was doing. I explained to him what ended up happening to the project that I was doing. And I just said like, and I was just really angry. So I posted that. And then (laughs) Mr. Anderson, that was his name or is his name. He starts talking about just like, do you have any idea like what this means? (laughs) and just like in his own words through the restorative circle he called it a teaching a teachable moment that's where he referred to it Mm. so I guess he was trying to have this teachable moment with me and just starts to like dismiss what I'm saying but also like brings up things like you know if anyone from the colleges that you've been applying to or any like job that you're trying to apply to sees this they're never going to accept you Mm. did you know that by typing this and like posting this online like you are just being like trump 
and he also mentioned how back in the day, like historically, how dogs were actually used for racist attacks. Um, so he just goes on and on about this, just those three main points. And then he says something else too along the lines of, if I had known that you felt this way or would write something like this on social media, I would have never allowed you to photograph for me um, or be involved in any of the clubs and like sports that you're in. Um, so at the time, like I said, like I, I had a really strong relationship and trust with this teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, he was our coach for softball. I was in softball for two years, my junior and senior year. So I interacted with him a lot. Not only did I spend three hours a day with him, um, but at adding to that three more hours that I would spend with him after school um, and referring to the photo, I would be in, I, he was the volleyball coach. And Mm -hmm. whenever he would need a photographer, I would always volunteer. Like I would always volunteer to spend time um, to just like practice my art, develop more skills, but also like to learn from him. Mm. Um, And I remember he was talking to me about that. And I was just like, what? Like, what the, you know, I was just like, why are you talking to me like this? Why are you saying those really hurtful things? Um, and I remember I just ended the conversation with him by saying, I don't regret what I posted. Mm. And when I said that, he just like rolled away in his chair. And I remember, I think it was like five more minutes until like the lunch period was because it was during lunch period. The mm. five minutes to lunch period were over. I remember I just like I remember I was just tapping like my leg and like tapping my pencil or whatever. And I just like started crying. Like I just called my dad. I'm like, hey dad, like, could you please pick me up? Like, I'm not having a good day. Like, I'm just really upset right now. Mm -hmm. My dad was like, okay, I'll I'll go pick you up right now. And as like the main office like beeps me and like tells me like, hey, like Veronica, you're, you have an early dismissal. And I'm like walking out of class crying and my my English teacher Miss Miss Lee um she was like filling up her water bottle and she's like hey like how are you and as soon as she said that mm-hmm. I just like started bawling I just started crying and crying and I was like oh my gosh and I just couldn't find the words like I couldn't explain it to her and she's like let's talk tomorrow mm-hmm. whenever you feel better um and so I instead of staying after class with Anderson, I ended up going to her class. Mm. And I just explained to her what happened. I remember she started crying too, mm. um, because again, she resonated to this. And I just felt really listened to and like cared for her because it's like, how do you explain to someone that you were just so angry over something mm. that's like happening in your community, but also like the, the distrust that just happened between you and the teacher? Mm. Um, and she just like really understood that um so we just like talked and like talked and I just spent like the last like three weeks talking with her about like what do I want to do and at the time like I actually ended up going to my principal and like trying to explain what had happened Mm. and I I was also just crying in her office um I was just crying and all she really did was just tell me like like there was like really like nothing that they could do. It was like my senior year. It was only like two two months left until we graduated. Mm. And that same week that I had this interaction with my teacher, with my art teacher, um, it was a week that we were taking our CP test. So it would like guarantee that I would graduate as a CP graduate. Mm. Um, I just was not in the emotional and like mental state to take that. And I just ended up like not participating. Oh, it was in a test, it was a project that I had to turn in. Mm. And I just like, couldn't really do it. Um, I didn't go to his class for the rest of the senior year. I was just moved to the counselor's office and I would just sit in the counselor's office. And then I got transferred into the other art class which was just right across from him. Mm-hmm. Um, with another teacher named Ms. Strengths. So, I was in photography in her class for the remainder of the year. And I just like, I just kind of gave up. Like I was just really angry. Mm. I was just really angry because nothing was really like, 
like my principal didn't really do anything about it besides just like moved me and like mm-hmm. not like I don't know like I guess I just kind of felt like I needed something else but I didn't know how like what that could be or yeah. how that could be um so I just ended up not graduating as a CP student because I didn't turn my project and I just I didn't develop a relationship with my teacher ever again like we try to have a restorative circle and it was me the art teacher Mr. Anderson Miss Lee and the counselor mm. and I, I just remember I was just like crying I was trying to get the words out I was just crying and crying I think I actually ended up writing what I wanted to say to him mm. and like try to explain the situation and I, I think I remember just reading it I think I yeah I think I just read it but I was like crying and like sobbing mm. and he just throughout that entire conversation he never apologized he didn't say sorry he just said that he wanted to take an opportunity to like again he's like I thought that this could just be a teachable moment that's all he said mm. um yeah I don't remember an apology I just remember me and my my teacher Miss Lee were crying <laughs> and she was just trying to like explain what she saw through my situation in her own eyes as well as like her personal interaction and like relation to something like this yeah and yeah that was it that that's the way that it was resolved we just had a restorative circle that didn't really feel restorative um I didn't go to my own graduation because of that because I I didn't graduate as a CP student I didn't like Mm -hmm. I just felt very like I was ripped off of all my hard work. I mean, I I gave so much of my energy and time into like my academics and like programs, like things that I wanted to like learn and like develop. Yeah. And then to not graduate, but also to have like these like harmful like interactions and kind of like weird place of where our relationship stood with like the adults in the building mm-hmm. I just didn't feel welcomed anymore in that school for a while mm-hmm. there was just like so much tension and like weirdness from all the teachers there because mm-hmm. eventually like all the teachers that like were kind of problematic they all eventually ended up having some sort of interaction with me whether it had been like us getting into a conversation and them just like not agreeing um or something like that like it was just I think the only time that anyone any of the adults ever apologized to me was Mr. Diagostino but that was for that was another that's another story as to why he he apologized to me um but yeah I didn't go to my graduation I still don't have my high school diploma actually like I have to go to the school pick it up or like get it but I had to pay even though I didn't go to my own graduation, like I had to pay for graduation fees, even though I didn't go to my own graduation. So I just haven't gone back (laughs) to get it. And maybe I'm just stubborn. Maybe that's just like the type of person that I am, but it's, it was a little hurtful, you know? Yeah. Um, And it was, it was also interesting because after I graduated high school, I got employed with Brighton Park Neighborhood Council. So I worked as a youth organizer with them. And part of my job and like my responsibilities was to facilitate student voice committee inside Mm -hmm. middle schools and back of the arts high school. Mm -hmm. Um, But the school didn't want me back into their building because of COVID protocols, as well as like, Mm -hmm. uh, like they, the school ended up having like a very like, um straining relationship with the organization Brighton Park Neighborhood Council because of Brighton Park Neighborhood Council's involvement I'm using air quotation marks because the only involvement that Brighton Park Neighborhood Council had with us as student voice committee was they literally just provided us with resources and tools Mm. and resources literally being knowledge like they just helped us like learn that was really it yeah but because of adultism, a lot of the adults in the school building thought that Brighton Park Neighborhood Council was telling us what to do, mm-hmm. when in reality, it was all student-based. Like, we decided what we wanted to do. We decided that, we decided how we wanted to take action or mm-hmm. what we wanted to take action towards. Mm-hmm. Brighton Park Neighborhood Council only supported us in that, you know, but they never told us what to do. But yeah. adultism, they thought that they did that. Um, so 
the principal of Principal Brecky ended up not wanting to do anything with BPNC in the school building um, regarding student voice committee. So I ended up not really being able to even go back to the school um, to provide that same support that Olivia, the organizer, once was able to provide to me. Mm. That's a lot. Yeah. A lot. And <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, you're so good, but I think it speaks to so much about needing to be validated by your school community when you are facing something so, you know, like upsetting both in your community at large and also in the school and to not be validated is like huge. And for you to like not have attended your graduation, not have your diploma and still, and not be able to go back and do the amazing work that you experienced is huge. So I, I feel like there's many I think entry points and like questions I had throughout that like I guess like if you could tell me a bit about like what BPNC's like work did look like back when you were still mm -hmm. in school um and the kind of you know you talk about learning I'm curious like what that looked like mm -hmm. yeah I mean I remember my like the first couple of issues that BPNC introduced to me and like that I felt really passionate about and kind of like, oh my gosh, like I actually feel like I can do something about this was at the time, oh my gosh, I forgot our governor's name. What was our um, governor's name? Bruce before? Rauner? Yes, Rauner, okay. At the time, Rauner was doing a lot of like public school education, like funding, like cut mm. on our funding. Mm. And at the time when we were talk about like, in student voice committee, when we would talk about these things that were affecting us, a lot of the times what we would connect it to was like lack of resources. Like mm -hmm. we would always be like, oh my gosh, we should have a student center. And like this student center should literally just be where students get to hang out. Mm -hmm. Like we just want to have a cool hangout spot right here. Like we have like this really open space in the second floor. And we would always be like, that should be our hangout spot. Mm -hmm. And when we would talk to our principal about it, she a lot of her response was like, well, we don't have the resources or like the funding, like, is that really a priority? Mm -hmm. um, so then we would come back as a group and we'd be like, well, how do we get the funding or like the resources for this? Mm -hmm. So then that's when our connections to school cuts and like school funding became like a little bit more like developed. Mm -hmm. So once you once we started learning about the numbers and just like how much money goes into police instead of like our school programs or art mm -hmm. programs and things like that, it just all felt like so much more clear as to like who makes decisions. How, how, how does this get to that? Like who gets to choose how much money goes into our schools versus like what doesn't? Mm -hmm. And that was my first introduction to kind of like activism. I remember I would get in a school bus um, like on a Saturday and it would be like myself and like a couple of other students from like different schools. So BPNC is like partnered with a lot of different community schools in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. like Kelly, Kiri, um, Brighton Park Elementary, um, just so many like wonderful schools. Um, and they have so many partnerships because BPNC provides like programming as well as like um, um, funding for some of these schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time, um, it was myself in a school bus, again, with students and then parents, parents were there too. And mm -hmm. I remember being so like amazed and like, wow, like there's so many parents here. Like, that's so mm -hmm. awesome. And that was like that intergenerational healing that I feel like mm -hmm. is really beautiful because again, like that connection of like my interaction with the school adults versus like my interaction with like school and like parents mm -hmm. who were like directly like listening to students and like advocating with us mm -hmm. advocating for us even too yeah. um, so I remember we ended up going to like Bruce Ronner's like one of his mansions and we were just like protesting outside we were getting recorded there was like uh, news broadcasters and everything we were just talking about like the impact that this has mm -hmm. um, on his decision making and like his policies for school funding mm -hmm. um, and then after that, like with money, like money comes everything, right? Money becomes everything. I mean, um, because once we started looking at that, like, oh my God, like why is there so much money going towards the police in our schools? Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like there is just so much money and what do they actually do? Right. Um, and it's like, once those questions started happening, we started developing like other, like not other understanding of just like the issues that we we're seeing mm-hmm. um, and how this is directly like, cause at the end of the day, everyone is affected by policing. Yeah. Like even the adults who are causing the harm, part of the reason why they think the way that they do or think that the solutions that they are providing are good is because they are affected by policing like they think that that works but it doesn't Mm -hmm. so like it was just like really fascinating because it started to become like the the difference between like having these conversations with our our, uh, with other adults with staff and like with students Mm -hmm. versus like having these conversations with like wait, hold on, let me take it back. Having the conversations about like what we're experiencing, what we're feeling versus like what it means like systemically, institutionally, um, and just like that comment, like it just felt like a lot more easier Mm. uh, to like distinct the two Mm. Um, because it kind of made it more like possible for us to like join forces and like think about us as combating this issue together mm-hmm. instead of feeling like oh my god I'm just going against my principal or just like this specific teacher mm-hmm. if that makes sense okay. yeah that's huge yeah it was it was really impactful um and then quickly after that like you started hearing about no cop academy you know because mm-hmm. once again what 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 if like we're all affected by like what's happening outside of our school as well as like in our communities, you know? Mm. Um, So yeah, we started talking about that. And then of course, immigration became such a big issue or always has been an issue, but it just became more like, just like there and like visible. Um, Mm. At the time, like something that BPNC like really helped me like through their mentoring and like the conversations that like, we were able to have with adults who were willing to listen to us and like mm. share information with us is that I started to become more reflective and like aware of how these issues directly impact me because a lot of the times like when you hear about policing like you just only think about like black people being in- impacted by it mm. when in reality it's just like such a bigger issue like we're all affected we're all affected by it, like policing, militarization, and like immigration, like they're all in like tag, like with ICE, like it's all connected. Mm -hmm. Um, So just like having the space to like be reflective of that and like aware of that, it was, it was so like amazing because I felt comfortable asking questions, but also Mm -hmm. like once again, just making those connections and like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just feel so like even thinking about it I'm just like wow like so much growth happened through there and like Mm. it was able it was the fact that it was able to happen was because of the support that I had from my mentors at BPNC as well as like the teachers like Miss Singh or Miss Bonson Mm -hmm. Nani who were like super attentive and like willing to listen and care for us Mm. as like make these like self that like discoveries and like exploration Mm. yeah That's huge. And that makes a lot of sense. You bring up No Cop Academy, and I'm curious if you could speak a little to the mission and goal of that movement um, for those who are not familiar, and then talk a bit about what your involvement looked like in that movement. Yeah, um, the No Cop Academy campaign um, started um, with the fact that the city was trying to create a cop academy in West Garfield Park. Um, This was all under Ram Emanuel, who at the time, oh man, um, at the time, like what was happening like in current events and like the way that a lot of the increase of this policing conversation started happening is because of the murder of Laquan McDonald. And I just remember like the first time that I heard about what had happened to, I remember that, oh my God, I'm sorry. This feels really like heavy and kind of just like going back through a lot of like conversations and like just memories and like difficulties of exploring this topic. 
yeah. um, you know, because we are talking about violence and murder and just like mm. the city not really like caring about the fact that young people are dying and being murdered by police. Yeah. Um, but there was a there was a there was specifically okay i'm thinking about destiny harris who is a resident at west garfield park and i just remember hearing about the importance to her to have more funding towards our schools and just our education and more community spaces and that that's the reason why money shouldn't be going towards this cop academy like we're talking about 90 million dollars towards this cop academy mm. and my first introduction to the people who were involved with this campaign was through an art party okay. um and through this art party we kind of just gave the space to create art together mm. you know, to talk about healing to talk about even the fact like this is what money should go towards. Like we should have more spaces where people can come together and like make art and like build community. Like this is what we ask for and like a lot of people need. Mm -hmm. um, and we started talking about like why this is dangerous to Chicago, why this is dangerous specifically to West Garfield Park residents who already like interact with police more than the average person. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the campaign lasted three years um, where it was just like back to back, like tension and like interactions with city council members, with the mayor at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and just like this overall goal of making sure that the campaign was being led by students and young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and through this campaign, like we just, we were just able to accomplish so much of that. Mm -hmm. um, so many of my friends are because I met them through that campaign and through that like work and through that community building that we did. Mm -hmm. um, and so even that is an example of like, mm, of just like the necessity of healing, you know, mm -hmm. and like having these spaces for us, for young people to come together and like talk about things that are affecting us mm. um yeah no cop academy was a really personal campaign to me because of that because i was challenged and i was very like ready i was just really ready i had so much energy um no cop academy is one of the first spaces where i found myself learning how to like take leadership but also like when to take a step back Mm -hmm. um, because of my again like that self-reflection and like those experiences like to policing like what is my connection to that and like how I'm able to ultimately support black young people mm -hmm. um, through those experiences but also like making sure that like I elevate that mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah no cop academy I mean I I, I learned so much today like it, it was such a important part of my like young young life even though I'm 23 I'm like I'm still so young <laughs> um, it feels weird saying that, like but yeah like they just helped me develop like so much more understanding of like state policing mm. state violence um and it was one of the first campaigns where I became very like physically involved like mm. lots of protests lots of like yelling at politicians at city council members um showing up at their fundraiser events showing up at aldermanic like ward nights um and just making sure that these politicians did not for like did not forget how accountable they are to the fact that so many young people are losing their lives or being murdered by police yeah because it's all connected, right? The amount of money that we put mm -hmm. towards policing compared to like school funding. Yeah. Um, and quickly that a lot of the, a lot of the young people that were involved in No Cop Academy, um, again, started making those connections to their own schools. 
which is how the conversation around school policing became very active and mm. the main, uh, a main campaign, like a, a starting point um, that came after No Cop Academy. Because um, ultimately, so what ended up happening was that the Cop Academy ended up being voted on by council members. Um, and it, it's now being built. I mean, we've delayed it for three, four years now. The, mm. And it's and it still could be delayed, you know, just saying. Um, but it is being built. The goal is to get it built by the, the city, um, even though we still don't want it. Um, yeah, sorry. I feel like I kind of... No, you're good. You were talking about kind of uh, campaigns to remove cops out of CPS emerging from that organizing as well. Yes, yes, that's a better way of putting it. Um, that can, yeah, police, uh, cops out of CPS became like an emerging campaign and kind of starting point for, you know, students who were involved in No Cop Academy. Because again, mm -hmm. not only were we like actively like learning and like developing these leadership skills, but we're also mm -hmm. applying them um, through our decision making, through the way that we talk about this issue, yeah. um, and like becoming organizers. That's when I became an organizer um, mm -hmm. through Help Up Academy, um, because now I'm taking all this information, all this knowledge, all this like that I've learned through No Cop Academy, and applying it through CPS. Uh, through my conversations with other students, through conversations with my classmates, mm -hmm. um, to talk about how this building, this being built in our city directly affects us mm -hmm. and is replicated within our schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so Cops Out CPS became a, a beautiful and like also very, very um, insightful campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very important to know. Um, I guess before I ask a bit more about Cops Out CPS, I'm curious if you could talk about um, the different people that were involved in No Cop and what those meetings and like actions, you talked about the art party, what other kind of events brought you guys together? Um, yeah, like where they're coming from, what other organizations were involved? And if your entrance into it was through BPNC or just kind of individually? Yeah. Um, so my first entrance to it was actually the, uh, it wasn't. Okay. So I remember it was a, it was a very small meeting um, with many other students. I don't remember what, I think it was the Village Leadership Academy. Mm -hmm. I remember that school being there um, and I talked about because a lot of the students were from that school, mm -hmm. from that meeting. Um, and it was myself and a, and a couple of the other students who were with, in back of the yards as well as Kelly and Carrie mm -hmm. um, and Hancock. Han yeah. And we attended this meeting to kind of just like talk about planning the art party as well as like thinking about what is needed for students to participate in the campaign. Mm -hmm. It was a very like a, it was, it was a very like a, um, it was a meeting that, yeah, anyways, sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's very necessary, but we, I remember the first contribution that I made to the campaign was I just made a flyer to invite young people to the art party. Mm. and just like how to get involved and I think it was like our social media handle as well as like the email to answer any questions that students mm -hmm. may have mm -hmm. and then I remember attending the first ever No Cop Academy art party and I remember feeling so excited and also really nervous um, just because a lot of the people who were there were adults and students and like young people across Chicago mm. um, so just a very intergenerational space and I also remember um the fact that this space just had so many queer and non-binary mm. trans people mm. um and it just in my in my personal experience like I have not really been around people mm -hmm. in this community like that mm. um so it was really like 
it was a really eye-opening experience because again like I I've lived in a very sheltered place I mm-hmm. I didn't really understand what it meant to be part of the LGBTQIA community um and so I I, I say that because it's important to note that no cop academy was led by young black people but also specifically black young queer non-binary trans people Mm. um and i think that's important because once again like we're talking about community members who are directly impacted by policing in so many different ways Mm -hmm. um through school policies right like whether it be like, you can't dye your hair, you have to wear a uniform, um, whether it be like through conflict that is happening within the school, mm-hmm. um, bullying, things like that, um, just like misunderstanding and like also like that lack of history and like conversation that our mm-hmm. classrooms have around like Chicago history. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like even thinking about like our sex ed classes, our health ed classes, like we don't really talk about our bodies. We don't really talk about development. We don't talk about romantic relationships. We don't talk about like Mm. even safe sex and things like that. And like, this is all directly connected when we talk about why our schools need more funding, why our schools need more spaces that are healing, that are welcoming, Mm. that are loving and caring instead of policing. Um, And also like mental health. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that all was adding up. I am curious then, like you mentioned earlier, you were, you were involved with Pilsen Alliance and mm-hmm. work that was going on around gentrification there. Was that during the same time that you were involved in No Cop Academy or? Um, slightly I mean I was always so I guess I've always been like a very like I want to be in this and that um Mm -hmm. at the time like I was attending like uh one summer Chicago programs that were happening with BPNC as well as Pilsen Alliance so I I had an internship with Pilsen Alliance for a year Mm -hmm. um and I was still involved in some way um because I I I I challenged myself to be a resource as mm-hmm. well as like making sure that the connections were being made. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember that I talked about No Cop Academy with my Pilsen Alliance um, mm-hmm. um, team, like all the young people that were involved with it. And we we talked about, because once again, like I am Latina, like I'm talking about the fact that so many of our ra- like racial tension, right, between, mm-hmm. um, oh my gosh, sorry, my cat just clawed me of of talking about just like these racial relationships racial healing that needs to happen as well as like addressing the internalized racism and the stereotypes that exist among latino communities Mm -hmm. um and i remember part of what felt like a responsibility to me was to talk about that with my connection to the Latino community, which at the time was Pilsen Alliance. Okay. Um, and like talking about like, how do we show up for these young black people? Like, how do we show up with, how do we show up for our friends who are young black people? Mm. Um, and so we directly made those connections. We talked about these difficult conversations, our, mm. our personal experiences with like talking to our parents about the COP Academy, talking to our parents about policing and like, challenging ourselves to make those connections like policing to ICE Mm. um, deportation right because there is a school to deportation pipeline as well right like Mm. a school to prison to deportation pipeline um and no cop academy also made space to talk about that right because there is mistrust there is a lot of mistrust between um Latino people and like Black people when it comes to talking about activism and organize especially in Mm -hmm. organizing spaces like this Mm -hmm. um so it felt like a very like important conversation and like work that needed to be done and still is being done Mm -hmm. um um, and I remember like something that No Cop Academy did like that's something that we did is that we actually talked about we actually helped lead and host um a march to talk about 
um, immigration and policing and like the connections to it. And I remember one of our chants was like, la migra, la policia, la misma porqueria, right? Because we are talking about the same shit, you know, like we need to start um, thinking about what it looks like for our communities to heal together, um, to advocate together mm -hmm. um, and to make change together, right? As cheesy as that sounds, but it's true. Yeah, I think that's very powerful. Yeah. Um, so how did, so I guess what did life look like for you as No Cop Academy was kind of progressing um, with the vote coming in, obviously um, being disappointment, but also a huge win in that it delayed the construction of the Cop Academy for many years. Mm -hmm. um, what did that look like for you, especially in, at that point in your life too? Yeah. Um, at that point in my life, um, it was really difficult. It was really challenging because I was also entering my freshman year of college or was a freshman in college. And mm -hmm. I actually had to drop out because of my personal experience with policing and like in my personal life. Um, I had to, I, I was in a relationship with someone who I ended up having to file a restraining order against. And you know, calling the police is really difficult when you have this understanding of what the police does, when you have an understanding of what the system of policing does to men, you know, mm -hmm. um, and specifically at the time I was dating a, a Black young person. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was a really difficult conversation and like decision to make, mm -hmm. um, as well as like it was my first introduction to accountability, right? Um, because obviously like my first, my first decision that I had to make regarding like this relationship, it wasn't to call the police or to make a restraining. If anything, I feel like I tried to do whatever I could to prevent to ever getting to that point, mm -hmm. but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just became a very reflective moment in my life because once again where is the support where are the resources to like mm -hmm. talk about this you know and like something that is so needed is that community that community trust that community accountability um so at the time that I was dealing with that it was also you no know, cop academy going through the final vote mm -hmm. um and I remember um I remember city council. So th the city is like terrified of us because we became such a, a strong campaign that nobody could like not talk about what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, it became a political debate. Like you would hear it in the mayoral forums. You would hear it in Elder Manic, like whenever they would run for, mm -hmm. um, for uh, office again, like they had to, they had to state their stance on whether they wanted the cop academy to be built or not yeah so it just became like and so many like campaigns like wanted to work on um pr like doing the work of making sure that these conversations around racism and policing were happening within their own like community and like their base um, mm -hmm. So we would co be collaborating all the time with like other organizations, other adults, other communities. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was getting a call. Um, um, and it just became such a a, a pivotal point um, and like a pivotal conversation mm -hmm. um, that the mayor was just scared. Like I, I think they even went to like the University of like Michigan mm -hmm. and. There were students there who literally had a, a sign that said no cop academy and they were chanting and like they he had to like run leaving mm. he had to like leave because he was so scared and like he's so intimidated by the fact that he could not like escape the fact that young black people were asking for this cop academy to not be built yeah. um so i remember the final vote it was in may i remember that so to enter city council, you have to like go through these elevators and like these long hallways and there was just security everywhere. Mm -hmm. They made it incredibly difficult to even get in the elevator and like try to make it organized. They had like these 
belts like divide people up and like they would just look at you as you're entering and like obviously like before the vote happened like no cop academy and like we built so much resistance and so much like protesting um like we we ended up like um taking over city council for like more than 10 hours Mm. we were there like for the entirety of the day until we got threatened by police you know we were getting arrested we were betting we were getting heckled by like um a lot of the city council people who would show up um they would be like pushing us as we're like locking down the elevators and like making Mm. sure that like we are creating this tension like protesting and like making sure that the message is clear like do you care for black young lives or not Mm. like that is the question because by allowing this cop academy to be built you're actively funding and divesting from black neighborhoods Mm. you are divesting from black lives um so it was just so much like political like and like uh like fire like fired up like we were all just really fired up um but anyways i i remember the the day of the vote uh there were more than thousands of people we had so many people show up to city council that day like we just took over the entire third floor mm. just the the entire third floor was just covered in people and they weren't letting anyone anyone into public comment only some of us were able to go, but we would kick, we would quickly like get kicked out. Um, and I remember my my personal interaction inside th- the third floor. Um, I was upstairs on the what is it like the panel that you can see inside of the city council the meeting? Yes, the balcony. There you go. Thank you. I was at the balcony, and I remember I was getting heckled by a police officer. Like he actually like had to like almost dragged me out because I I was getting kicked out because I was like yelling and like chanting alongside my uh the rest of everyone who was there Mm -hmm. um and I just remember that's what the interaction was like for everyone like we were all getting kicked out we actually had someone who was getting like physically assaulted by the police like there in front of us all literally stating and like showing what it is that we're fighting against because there's no reason for a young person to be heckled and like arrested or like pushed down onto the floor Mm -hmm. um, just because they are trying to speak up just because they're trying to read something that they wrote Mm -hmm. um and we just took over city council if you actually look at the city council transcript um you can you can see that uh, us chanting was being written as Mm. part of the the transcript um because that's how loud we were they were being interrupted every like 10 five seconds because of our chanting we were just incredibly loud you would just walk out and you would hear the stomping you would hear the chanting um and it was just really intense and it was also just really beautiful and also really healing to know that we were being supported Mm. Um, and something that i feel like is important to talk about this campaign is that when we decided to like take this on and like actually launch the campaign, we knew that our chances of winning were zero. Like we knew that we had no chance of actually winning mm-hmm. um, against this COP Academy because of how like planned it was to have it, but also because of the people who held office at the time. Um, however, we wanted to like take this as an opportunity to like build community relationships to have this educational like political education going on to Mm -hmm. have leadership development for young people to also challenge adults and what it means to support a a youth-led campaign Mm -hmm. um to have people step out of their comfort zones right because part of organizing and campaigns is that everybody has a role it's not always just like directly like showing up for protests like there is so many more roles that exist Mm -hmm. in being able to have a successful like not only campaign but also like community space because part of what made no cop academy so special to me is the fact that it, it is a campaign but it also like still exists to this day in my life like the the people that I built relationships with like present in my life and it's still a space that I regularly go to and like 
practice in, practice accountability, mm-hmm. practice learning in, um, as well as like leadership and just like healing and so many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, ultimately, like I mentioned, like the COP Academy ended up being voted on and like, it's still in motion, right? Um, mm-hmm. And like, we were still able to have really great accomplishments, even though we knew that we were gonna lose. We had great accomplishments and like small wins that ended up factoring into bigger wins, right? Um, um, through the conversation of like defund the police, right? Through the conversation of school policing. Um, those are all great wins because we were able to accomplish the the energy and the momentum as well as like the resources because now we have a toolkit and we had this documentation of everything that happened during the campaign and what we learned about what we're combating against when it comes to city council um you know through the campaign like so many of us young people learned what a FOIA was which is the freedom of information act um and now we know the power of just stealing this information and like knowledge from the council and the state and all these things um so developing those skills and just applying them to like other issues and other campaigns that we're all a part of or um trying to initiate um it's just an it's just a the legacy of no cop academy and that involvement like still continues to this day um because you look at what's happening at stop cop city in atlanta right like um there's that influence that we have on each other right through the, the sharing of the resources what we learned we have this toolkit like i mentioned that a lot of campaigns like students and like everyone can look at and learn from if they ever want to start a campaign on their own mm. um, or even study how a youth-led campaign is mm. um, so yeah i would say that it's been very impactful and again to this day like it, the knowledge and like what we learned and continue to learn is expanding and growing yeah i think that's beautiful that you kind of look at the interconnectedness of a lot of things um and see the ways in which the kind of that legacy lives on in current movements. Mm-hmm. Could you tell me just a bit about, I guess, cops um, out CPS, um, and then I could ask a few questions about kind of your larger takeaways um, and and long term politics and commitment. Yeah. Oh man. Um, cops out CPS. Um, actually, if I could get a moment to get my laptop charger. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Um, with cops of CPS, oh man, it's been so long. Um, mm-hmm. So like I had mentioned, a lot of the young people that were involved in No Cop Academy um, emerged into this other campaign, um, cops at CPS and just making those connections. Um, I would say that this campaign is a lot like It's a lot like heavier because when you talk to people about like school policing and like what what it feels like to have police in schools, like a lot of what you hear is the school shootings. And it's like, it feels like such a heavy topic and conversation because again, it is, it is such a violent thing to have police in our schools, police in the educational setting, um, especially when you talk about that, like school shootings that are happening. Mm-hmm. Um, because mm, I want to make sure that I have the the right words and like the mm-hmm. right things to say about this. Yeah. Um, just because it is something that we hear so much when we talk about police in schools. Mm-hmm. And it, it just feels like school shootings and like police in schools are such different topics, but there is a, there is like somewhat connections, right? Yeah. Um, but I would say that with CAFSA CPS, the difference between like the conversation of like community policing compared to school policing is the fact that our targets kind of changed um you know thinking about no cop academy for example our targets for a city council and like mm-hmm. the mayor um 
compared to COPSA CPS, where our target is the the Board of Education. Right. Um, and specifically during this time when we had COPS out CPS, excuse me. Um, we had so many young people who had energy, but were also so exhausted. Again, you know, for example, me, like at the time I had actually gone through a really horrible assault by a police officer um because this was all during the uprisings of George Floyd Mm -hmm. and many of us like including myself like we were all assaulted by police officers because of these uprisings um and we all had just undergone like such serious like violence again we're all still like in our 20 like entering our 20s Mm. trying to figure out things um and I and I and I feel like this is important to mention because these campaigns are just so personal to us. You know, we are learning the balance of like living life and like organizing, but also like Chiquita. I've also like um sorry. Let me... You're good. Okay. Um, and I mentioned that again because of just that it's just all so personal to us. Mm-hmm. And it's important to us, which is why it's hard to like say, I'm gonna make time to rest and re-energize. Um, and it's also very demanding work because capitalism, you know, is always moving, it's always running. Um, and so is like city council with the way that they run things and push things forward. Um, and the same applies to the Board of Education, right? Like it's all just so fast paced. Mm. Um, and it's like done like that on purpose, right? You know, a lot of these Board of Education meetings that would happen to talk about policies or things that they're introducing and or their approval of contracts, right? Like they would have these meetings during times where students aren't able to participate yep. in them, right? So it's all just very systematic, like it's all very systemically like done and like rooted in the fact that they don't want community members to actually be involved. Yeah. Um, And so when we started talking about these, we started learning about just how much money was going into this contract within police, uh, within the Chicago Police Department and the Chicago Public Schools we started developing and like researching like what kind of police officers are getting hired like what is the hiring process how is it that a police officer ends up sitting at a front desk where they just sit and only interact with students and to yell at them or to you know threaten them or Mm -hmm. to respond to any sort of issue that a student might be going through like why are they the first person to interact with students with Mm -hmm. that type of energy and like reason instead of like other things like a nurse or a librarian even or a counselor or a restorative justice practitioner like why is it that police officers are prioritized as a interaction with students um, instead of other resources and other people who are actually like not to fall into the to the Um, to the trap of saying like, oh, well, police officers just need more training and more this and that to like have that understanding. Like, no, police officers don't have any responsibility to have with students regarding their well-being or their health or their care, like at all. Like, if anything, that just falls into the trope of giving police more money when they already have more than enough. If anything, they need to be defunded, right? and given that money back into schools and other programs and other people who are, whose actual responsibilities and like job is to like care for students and make sure that they're okay and to assist them in resolving any conflict that they might be facing. Mm. Um, and so we would, as students, we would set up these meetings with the Board of Education members. Um, we would show up to their, we would show up to their, um, public meetings to talk about policies and the contracts and things like that. Um, And it also became, um, again, learning from the past campaign of No Cop Academy, right? Like 
you can only hope and depend so much on these decision-making people, right? That it felt like, what is the goal of the campaign, right? Like, Mm -hmm. is the goal to just like, be excruciatingly annoying to these board members, which we did. We were excruciatingly annoying. Like we would show up to their houses. We would show up uh, to the houses with like a workshop intact with music and just like the goal of just trying to get them to talk to us, right? But we would be so annoying. Like they would hate us, but we would love it because a lot of the board members that we would be dealing with would just be like annoying, you know, or like very like stubborn and just very like, obviously not willing to listen to us Mm. um so once again we had to ask ourselves the question of like what is the goal with this campaign like to build power was one of the reasons right to build understanding and like knowledge as to like what does school policing do to us like what is the impact what is our interaction what is our experience and also the history of school policing like what how did we get to this point where police are are first responders to school issues Mm -hmm. Um, and that just became very vital and important because that history is often sometimes things that cps right chooses to kind of hide or Mm -hmm. ignore Um, because once again it has to do with racism it has to do with like um um just like this heavily like policing Mm -hmm. um, that they're not willing to take accountability for as well as like acceptance, right? Like, you know what, this is history that we're willing to accept and like do something about, like they just don't wanna do anything with it. Um, And so thinking of those being our goals, we ended up working really hard and having workshops available for students. We would work really hard in building relationships with teachers because teachers were vital in this, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers were so vital in this because we needed to make those connections and have that understanding of the students and the school. Like, what is your school like? What does your school feel like with police officers? Mm -hmm. What is missing from your school? And just like honoring and centering the personal interactions and stories that students had dealing with police, Mm. Um, as well as like challenging teachers, right? So that was an ask that we had for teachers um, and just adults in general. Like, how are you challenging yourself in thinking about your response to conflict and your response to hearing about a stories, uh, a student's a specific issue right or an understanding of what the student might be going through Mm -hmm. um and that was the beauty of what no cop academy was able to accomplish too right um Mm -hmm. because of the work that no cop academy did adults felt responsible and accounted for in order to be like you know what i am willing to ask what is it that my students need from me as an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, we had those really wonderful conversations with teachers. Teachers were doing that work, having their own workshops and conversations amongst each other to talk about policing and what they can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and like getting students to talk about these things with teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the reason why that was so important is because when we went to CPS and had these meetings with the Board of Education to talk about policing, school policing, their response was, well, each school is different, which is true, each school is different, Mm -hmm. excuse me. But um, LSE ultimately needs to be the one to make that decision. So local school councils have to make that decision for their own school on whether or not they want police to be there. Mm -hmm. And we took that and we were like, you know what? that's actually a great opportunity to build this power. That is a great opportunity because local school councils have power Mm -hmm. and local school councils are made up of those school staff, parents and community members. And so we found ourselves challenging each other and like going to local school councils and their meetings and talking to parents, talking to teachers and just doing all this work to develop this understanding of school policing as well as like how it affects our school community and what can our school community use the money that would go for police Mm. instead for something else. Yeah. Um, So through that, we actually had 
some really wonderful wins. A lot of schools, local school councils, ended up voting to not have police in their schools. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have students who would show up for the local school council meetings and like share their story, share why they don't want police, share what they want the money to go towards to instead. And mm -hmm. ultimately, like, I remember I actually ended up going to back of the arts high school for their local school council meeting. Mm -hmm. And I remember something that a parent said, and this parent voted, no, they don't want police officers in school. Mm -hmm. And she said, I think that it's time that we listen to students. Mm -hmm. If they feel like they don't want police in schools and they're sharing this information with us, we should listen to them and give it a chance to try something new. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was feeling so excited hearing that and so proud because a year before that the vote ended up happening, we had attended that same meeting and, and that parent was also there. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I read a testament, some other students read a testament and ultimately they ended up voting yes to keep the police officers in mm -hmm. school. So to see that growth and to see that response after students and like adults had been putting in work and doing workshops and having these conversations um, and also doing this research, like it just felt very impactful. Um, so I don't have, I, I'm really bad at, I should have done this before, but I don't remember how many schools ended up voting against having police officers mm -hmm. in the schools, but we had a pretty large number outside of, um, I'm sorry, um, in the Chicago Public School District, like yeah. voting to remove police officers from their school. Yeah. Um, and so that that's obviously a, a huge win and something that is still being worked on because to this day, like CPS still has the, the power yeah. to see what has happened with those schools and the growth of where that money should go instead mm -hmm. of police. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what it was like for you to engage in this kind of organizing as an alumni um, this time around. And if kind of your work with BPNC as an organizer is what kind of, I guess like the, the entry point you had into this campaign or, yeah. Yeah, um, as, it, as an alumni, it was kind of difficult, but I felt more powerful. Mm. I definitely felt more powerful because it felt like at the time when I was a student and like having all these like interactions and kind of like hurtful things regarding like my experiences, like the experiences of other students, mm. like were feeling invalidated through my school year experience, but compared to like when I graduated and like really felt, it sounds weird, but felt validated by the world and like actually mm. like people who cared for me, mm. um, I just felt more powerful. And it also felt very like, hmm, very like you tried to like shut me up, but you couldn't type of thing, you know? Like mm. I remember this is, this is kind of like funny to me, but my principal, I remember the first ever SDC meeting, like this was before I decided to be like a little bit more outspoken, a little bit more mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna tell this teacher that they're being racist type of energy. Uh, before that, I actually had my principal tell me, I can see that you're gonna take my job one day. And I think at the time she didn't say it, you know, like, mm -hmm you're going to steal my job, like you're going to get me like resigned or whatever, fired. I think at the time she just imagined me being a principal. Mm. But looking back at it, I'm like, yeah, I definitely <laughs> could. <laughs> I definitely could. Yeah. So, yeah. so just like, I don't know, I felt more like confident and just like assured of what it is I'm feeling and seeing mm. and like fighting for, you know, because mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I've mentioned it throughout this entire conversation that we've had, um, I guess of me talking, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is that, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, is that everything, like the way that I was able to just like take everything that I was listening to and like learning and reflecting mm -hmm. on is just because of how I have looked at 
my personal experience it's just the way that it's affected mm. me like to actually look at it that way yeah. um to have an understanding of capitalism of racism of institutional of institutions and like the systems you know it has really helped me like have clarity and understanding um instead of feeling like it's a me problem mm. uh, which is something that I felt throughout my school years mm. because that's what it felt like they were putting on to me like it's just a you problem like you need to be a good student you need to be like better than the racist person you know mm. when it's not like that like it shouldn't be like that yeah if that makes any sense no absolutely makes so much sense and and you even did speak to it a bit earlier about the kind of learning that occurred for you during your organizing that helped you kind of connect and also simultaneously distinguish like here are my feelings here are my experiences and then kind of systemic and structural understanding that like organizing kind of helped you Mm -hmm. connect and then find next steps from that yes. acknowledgement so like it makes absolute sense and I think is a huge takeaway from organizing mm -hmm. um, so like throughout when you are telling me all these like rich and tangible like experiences you had in these two movements you did also constantly touch on like the impact it had on you um, and on your politics and on the things that you were committed to um, and so I, looking back at all of those years of involvement, what are you most proud of? <laughs> um, wow, that's a, that's a good question. I think what I'm most proud of is the fact that I welcome being challenged. Mm -hmm. I think like thinking about just again like those relationships that I had with adults and just like they just did not want to be challenged or like they don't want to listen to what I felt I was feeling at the time or what I was experiencing or thinking out loud even I would say that that's something that I'm really proud of because being challenged isn't a bad thing you know through my years of working with BPNC and just like again like I was in charge of facilitating and like creating curriculum for mm -hmm. school students and high school students, but never did I ever think that the way that I was teaching it was the only way. Mm. You know, never did I think that my understanding of it was the only way. Mm. And being in spaces with other young people, it just felt like like I'm learning from them. I'm learning with them too. Um, and like I'm and I feel like that just applies everywhere. Like it's okay to be challenged. If anything, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to just like expand yourself in other ways, mm. um, emotionally, you know, mentally, and even spiritually, I would mm. say. Um, yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Um, my next question has to do with future Chicago high school students, future Chicago youth organizers. But before I get to that, you did mention like you currently work at BPNC um, and do that work with youth. So kind of for someone who's not familiar with BPNC and the partnership that you guys have with different schools, like give me like a quick rundown of what that work looks like for you now. And yeah. yeah. Um, well, at the time, I'm, I'm actually not working with BPNC okay. anymore. I've been I've I've let go of um, that job for the last two years now um but organizations um with bpnc their partnership and like their programming that they have is and multi-generational so they work with parents adults um and students and young people right mm -hmm. um and they work through different aspects of different issues um starting with like housing um starting with immigration um uh addressing like violence in our community uh schools obviously like with the, uh, mm -hmm. the student voice committees and just like the amount of programming that they have um like they have uh 
so many clubs for students like after school program mm -hmm. starting with sports or arts um and anything else that students might want mm -hmm. um as well as other issues and like topics that bpnc is really passionate about like mental health mm -hmm. um so for example the treatment not trauma campaign um which is a which is another wonderful and beautiful campaign that directly like challenges um, and talks about policing and, and healing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and mental health, which, you know, Brighton Park Neighborhood Council is in Brighton Park and a lot of the Brighton Park residents are of Latino descent. So those conversations again around like racial relationships mm -hmm. um, and also like mental health uh, is very like important because mm -hmm. mental health is something that, you know, we don't, we see, it being constantly divested from like when it comes to our health and our well-being for so many black and brown communities like it is literally divestment that is happening around our health um so another wonderful and like really impactful campaign um and then i'm sorry i know you asked like um what kind of programming and like things we do like that i guess like what you did specifically when um, you in that position yeah, um, so for me specifically, I, again, I was partnered with the neighboring schools, the middle schools and the high mm -hmm. schools, um, as well as I would help create curriculum and monthly meetings for young people mm -hmm. to encourage them to build relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, I would try my best to introduce students from Kelly to students with Kiri, mm -hmm. um, just because of that connection and like again reminder of like this is how we build community you know mm. um and i would help build curriculum for our one summer chicago program which would mm. be for seven weeks no four weeks seven weeks seven week program mm. um, where we would take students from or young people ages um 16 to 24 um to further develop their understanding of issues that are happening in the community, mm -hmm. uh, as well as how to take action um, and further de their develop uh, leadership skills. Mm -hmm. And through that, that's that's also a really awesome experience that I had just like learning with students as well as um, trying to get them like locally involved, have a local understanding of like, who is our alderman? What are wards? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of like that political understanding and development, political mm -hmm. education. Um, and also like, once again, encourage like this meeting of new people, meeting people from the community, hearing from others, because we would also partner with other organizations and just like work together around a similar campaign or something that we cared about. Um, and then we would have, um, we would do a lot of canvassing mm -hmm. uh, to just show uh, an example of what it looks like to um, advocate and like do some, an example of some political work. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really awesome. We would also sometimes have some of our middle school students mm -hmm. uh, participate in that program, which was really, really awesome. Um, and something else was that every year we would have an annual youth summit and this youth summit was specifically for our middle school students mm -hmm. um and this youth summit would happen every year with more than like 500 to 600 students from grades six through eighth grade mm -hmm. we would partner with uic um to host this annual youth summit and the Youth Summit consisted of uh, just countless workshops that students got to choose from. And they spent the entire day at UIC attending those workshops, hearing from, excuse me, from other organizations and other community leaders, um, as well as like having some fun because of course, like these topics are really heavy and like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's also important to like give young people the space to be curious about other things that aren't like completely dreadful. <laughs> uh, so we would, you know, they would have like art, they would talk about mental health, they would talk about um, sex ed sometimes, um, 
and just like other fun workshops around like the campaigns that are happening around the city. Mm. Um, I remember we had one workshop that was really asked for a specific year, which was around student rights, mm. um, which was really cool because we talked about student rights and adultism. Um, so yes, once again, just those, and it was and part of the annual youth summit too, is that the students from student voice committee would be the ones to organize it. So I didn't do all that work by myself. It was students who were actively like going back to their schools and mm -hmm. applying what they were learning through student voice committee. Um, and just like hearing from students, like how do we collect data from students? How do we talk about the things that we're seeing um, and like talking about here um, and like try to talk to others about it? Um, so the students were the ones who were choosing the workshops. They were choosing the design and like the theme of the mm -hmm. of the youth summit. So, for example, one of them, one of the themes was let youth be youth, mm -hmm. um, because students at the time were really passionate about talking about adultism, as well as like once again like oh my gosh, like why can't we have a day like once a month even in our school year where we could just have like a fun day as students, you know? Mm -hmm. So having those conversations with them and like like that creativity was really important. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, like, like I mentioned, BPNC was um, a part of many coalitions as well as like campaigns. So part of my responsibilities was to also like represent like what I've been hearing from young people through these mm -hmm. campaigns that I'm directly connected to from mm -hmm. our student voice committees and just like representing that aspect of young people and making sure that they're being centered around campaigns and work that is happening in the city. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot of powerful work and it's I think it's beautiful that you kind of got pulled into organizing work when you were younger by people at BPNC doing this kind of work and you've kind of given back and also created that space for other young people in the city. So that's like a huge kind of full circle um, yeah. experience. Um, before my last question, like, I guess, where are you now? And like, where do you hope to go? And what does organizing <laughs> have to do with any of it? Yeah, um, where am I now, man? That's a, that's a fun question. I know, it's a tough one. <laughs> Um, well, like I had mentioned, I actually left BPNC two years mm -hmm. ago now. Um, I Organizing work is very personal. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that there was a moment in time where I tried to separate the two, separate work life to personal life, but it was not working for me. And it actually felt more harmful to me mentally and emotionally mm -hmm. and also physically um, because when I finally accepted this feeling of I am not okay. Like I am not mm. doing the work that I want to do because I am not okay. Mm. And deciding to like step away from that was really, really difficult and something that I actually had a really hard time even admitting to people around me. Mm. When they would ask me like, well, why are you leaving? I'd be like, oh, I'm just trying to change careers. When in reality, like, I'm like, I want to do this forever, but I can't. Right. <laughs> um, it's also like capitalism. You know, like, I don't want to, mm -hmm. it felt like I was just at some point, once again, like that division of like, oh, work life, personal mm -hmm. life, it started to feel like I'm only doing this to get a check right now. And mm -hmm. I just did not like, it felt really like guilty, but also like, it's the only way that organizations were able to work, right? Mm -hmm. Through funding, 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 funding. Mm -hmm. So it just felt very like, again, the nonprofit industrial complex mm -hmm. um, I felt like I was getting hit by it um as well as like once again personal things that were happening in my life you know I had just left a really harmful and like abusive relationship mm -hmm. um and I also just dropped out of college you know you're talking about someone who loved being in school loved learning having to drop out um, because once again, with the lack of resources, the mm -hmm. lack of like funding, you know, college is expensive. Yep. Um, so I just, I just decided to leave just to cut it in short, simply. Um, and I've been unemployed since because um, healing takes a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> healing is a really long process. Um, and I would say that where I'm at right now is I'm definitely in a healthier and more, more stable 
place. Mm. Um, it's really hard to figure out how to find my way back into organizing because I really do mm. um, want to be back in spaces like that, um, but more where it's more volunteer based, I think, mm. as for my capacity right now. Mm. So I find myself more into gardening and like mm. growing and um, putting in more labor that feels physical right now. Mm. Um, but I, I do like really have this feeling of like wanting to be present through school. Um, so I would love to maybe like continue developing my understanding of mental health mm. and resolving conflict and mm -hmm. accountability. There's so many resources and like opportunities to like how to resolve conflict, you know, and, and mm -hmm. like within the community, within personal relationships that really interest me and something that can be applied to like our personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love to maybe like one day be a restorative justice practitioner at a school mm -hmm. or something or a counselor even. Um, but for right now, like uh, I'm definitely interested in just like going back into research and like developing those skills and, mm -hmm reminding myself how to talk <laughs> how to talk better about these things um and yeah I mean I, I've also like kind of settled with the idea of just like finding something like from nine to two p.m or something because I can't stay mm. up to five. <laughs> mm. nine to two p.m or something and like the rest of my time is for myself and like mm. other commitments like gardening or volunteering at organizations um mm. overall just hoping that um there's a way for us to like just dismantle capitalism period yeah. i'm so here for that yeah. and it's also beautiful and also extremely courageous and difficult in our world to do to center kind of healing um and actually practice that and like actually you know say screw capitalism and like mean it and do it in your day to day and so yes. um I'm very excited for for you um and and also feel very inspired as well um from that last question I promise <laughs> what do you have to say to current and future Chicago youngins who are resisting um speaking truth to power um and working on campaigns around racial justice, education, equity, all of that stuff. Yeah, I would say that my advice is to continue being annoying, mm. <laughs> to just be so annoying, like just live in your truth and to exercise it and to continue pushing limits, you know, questioning things, even if you've asked a question already you know, ask it to someone else. Um, and I would also say center like yourself in your experiences, center others um, to, I would also say practice listening and taking notes. I wish, I really wish that I had done a better job at documenting things mm. um, just because there's so many experiences so many ideas that I had when I was in high school that I really wished I had written down somewhere mm. um, even if it's a silly idea I'll write it down yeah. and document it you know and also to have fun be creative mm -hmm. um, have so much fun with organizing especially in a school setting like mm. you'd be surprised like oh my gosh like even like thinking about the COVID like and like how students were forced to be like remote mm. Oh my god like I just kept trying to encourage my sister I'm like dude just like organize your schools so that nobody has remote classes anymore mm. like just do it because you shouldn't like if the school isn't going to fund remote learning like properly and like mm. to actually care about students instead of like making it based on testing and like things like that and like ignoring like this real issue like don't participate in that mm. like, organize 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 and like share and like talk to your friends about this yeah talk to your friends talk to each other and like just remember like that power that you have in you that's like I just want to get this done like I actually believe in this like follow that yeah, yeah. that's awesome the politics of refusal is huge yes um, conversations are important and 
that note on documenting is so big and I hope that you know just by talk you know this conversation that being recorded that being documented is like one step closer to like a lot of these movements getting the attention and documentation that they deserve so appreciate you so so much um thank you so much for making the time Veronica and um very excited for other people to kind of hear your experience and your voice thank you so much for listening to me <laughs> so before I press um stop on the recording this mm -hmm. part so from here from here on out Jesus Christ um the recording will be cut out and so this would not be part of any kind of archive or anything that other people see okay. um I just have to like for research purposes or whatever so I know the kind of sample of interviews I'm working with um there's a list of dem demographic questions that ask about your identities um so, so you can say like you don't want to answer any question for whatever reason it's okay okay um so what racial and or ethnic identities would you identify with Latina. Um, and then what gender identities would you identify with? Non-binary. And then were you eligible for free and reduced lunch programs while growing up? Yes. And then what level of education did your parents complete? Um, my mom only completed middle school and my dad completed high school. Okay. And then what kinds of responsibilities, like generally speaking, did you have after school while you were in high school? Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So what kinds of responsibilities did you have after school when you were in high school, just generally speaking? Mm, not really much. <laughs> mm, so yeah. you, you kind of already said like you kind of did a lot of like after school, like clubs and organizing work, right? Yeah, yeah, I would just, I would just try my best to have some sort of income for myself. So I would always, again, I would always be like in programs that were paying um, okay. internships. Um, and yeah, I didn't really start becoming more responsible for like home things like mm -hmm. regarding my siblings until after high school. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty much all I have with the questions. Um, I want, I can't believe we've been on this Zoom call for two hours, two hours and 30 minutes, um, but it was all worth it and a story that needed to be told. Um, and so I want to be mindful of that and let your brain rest as well. Um, I will follow up um, when this is transcribed. It kind of sometimes misses like names or like you will say an organization's name and it will pick it up. And okay. so I might text you and just be like, hey, you were talking about this and said this, like, could you clarify what that is? Um, and then I also want to be mindful of how extractive these interviews kind of feel. You tell me so much. Sorry. It's okay. We'll be hopping on to a different call after this. Oh, day. crazy. Sorry. Um, no, you're so good. But um, they're super extractive and like you just share a lot and I'm just sitting here like, listening um and recording and so I can kind of acknowledge that part and so I can follow up and give all my interviews an option of just like scheduling a follow-up it could be like two weeks out that's just like a 15 minute phone call maybe you can ask any questions we can chit chat about the, the interactions and also all of you guys are so cool um and so like I would always love to keep connected um oh, yes. so I'll make sure to follow up with especially those transcription notations and then chat more about where this archive will go um if you have any input on where you think it should go um and all of that stuff I'm so open to okay for sure thank you so much for all of this and like of being so cool of course thank you for sharing your story with me and I hope your night is a lot more restful than <laughs> I know the last two hours have been so I appreciate yeah, you so for sure it. yours too yours too I hope you get some rest all right you have a good night Thanks. Bye. Bye.